to Data Colors 2014 webinar series. I'm David Toby, Product and Technology Manager at Data Color, and we have a great webinar set up for you today. This is going to be a panel discussing images and uh, imaging techniques and some pretty cool software. So I'm here, as is often the case, with David Saffer. David Saffer is a professional photographer and photo educator from Southern California which given the weather elsewhere right now is a good place to be. Uh, we also have with us from our partner in crime today, McFun Software, Dan Hughes. Now McFun is a new company to our field. We've, we've noticed them first in the, in the um, iPhone application area where they quickly jump to the top as the leading iPhone software company. Uh, don't let that fool you. Don't let that make you think that they're, they're about nothing but uh, fun stuff with a PHUN in it or about uh, you know amateur photography because they have some fantastic tools for serious photo editing. Tools so good that they compete very nicely against anything on the market and are often preferable for doing various specialty functions to what you would have natively in Photoshop or Lightroom. So we'll get into some of that uh, hopefully today, but I'm going to let David Saffer take charge and let him introduce Dan and tell you um, what it is that we're hoping to accomplish today. So here it is, David. Thanks for the nice introduction. Hi, everyone. This is David Saffer. Uh, welcome to Landscape Image Editing and Enhancement. Uh, Dan Hughes is my partner in crime along with David Toby. A little bit about Dan Hughes. I first met Dan when he was working with Nick Software. We did several webinars together. He did the, he was their uh, webinar trainer for about four years, and he is now the director of education for MacFun. They have some incredible applications, things that really help with image enhancement and editing, uh, far beyond what you could do with uh, so-called naked Photoshop or naked Lightroom. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about display calibration and color management just to set the stage properly. Um, um, I forgot to mention that Dan is a, f a photographer heavily into landscape work, so uh, he's the right guy for the right job in this case. And of course, my own work includes a lot of landscape work um, along with my commercial and, and other photography. So let's get started. We're going to go um, straight to the first slide and just talk a little bit about the big picture. Um, we're going to be talking about creativity on multiple levels. We're going to be talking about each image that we're editing uh, from the standpoint of its merits uh, as a creative piece, uh, also its strengths and weaknesses in terms of the use of light and contrast and color. Uh, and we'll be going through the stages of um, capture, talk a little bit about initial editing, but also um, put strong emphasis on enhancement and adding some levels of, how do I put this, um, change or, or morphing of the image that you probably can't do without a great deal of effort in, in the normal applications that you're accustomed to using. A lot of flexibility and ease of use. Uh, and we also want to emphasize the importance of color managed workflow. I mean, color managed workflow, uh, I'm at a photo conference right now, and virtually half the people I talk to uh, don't have a display calibration device, which is to their detriment. And the reason is simple, is that, that that display calibration device helps you not only control the color on your screen, but the light intensity, which is important in terms of managing shadow and highlight detail. So in, in terms of workflow, you know, first things first, get it right in the camera, and that includes your exposure and dynamic range, et cetera. And you really want to manage your display, which I'll talk about briefly in just a moment, so that you're involved in color accurate image editing. And, and that, that means a lot to me, that the grass is green and the sky is blue, that skin tones look right, so that when you do get into some of this flexible and efficient image enhancement, that you're heading down the right path, that you're not editing to a destination that's going to inherently be wrong, that the colors are actually not, you're not being shown colors that are real or realistic you're being shown colors that are off, and virtually every display comes out of the box needing calibration. And computer display calibration involves, like I said before, controlling um, hue, saturation, and lightness. Uh, you really want to see the colors be correct. You want the saturation levels to be correct, and you want to see the brightness 
both at the top end and the bottom end of your dynamic range be uh, accurate so that you're editing, like I said before, to the right destination. Display calibration is very simple. Uh, we have, as you can see with my cursor, a spider device on screen. The software runs through a series of color patches and the spider device reads those. The software calculates whether those color patches are reading correctly or not and makes adjustments to the computer so that when you're running the computer with that display connected that you've calibrated, you're going to get the right color, the right dynamic range, and you're going to be able to see your images as they truly are. And so when you get into doing image editing or image enhancements, you get the right result. You're not going to wind up, for example, with prints that look too dark. That's typically a display that's too bright. Or you're going to get prints that uh, have a color cast in them or things like that. Uh, those are all very important aspects of, of uh, a color managed workflow and getting a good photographic workflow going. Now, what I'm going to do is hand over to Dan, and Dan and David and I are going to discuss a series of photographs. Uh, he's going to show you some basic edits, and then we're going to get into some more sophisticated editing and enhancements, and we're all going to be involved in a conversation where uh, we're looking at those images and talking about their merits, their strengths and weaknesses, and how we might make them better. So Dan, it's over to you. Very good, and, and you're able to see my screen now, correct? Um, I do not. I'm, I'm seeing your screen, the McFun homepage, okay. is that correct? Perfect. Yes, sir, that's it. Uh, so that, we'll just go ahead and get into it then. What, what we're looking at right now is there the MacFun homepage. I wanted to just pop that up, and, and we can talk more about uh, where you can get more support for, for the MacFun tools uh, later on, uh, but this is just an easy way to... Uh, to sort of transition. As, as David Toby and, and David Sapper have, have mentioned, MacFun uh, is a series of plugins. It's a series of, of other tools, photographic editing tools as well for the iOS system. So your your Android, or sorry, your Apple, um, you know, your iPhone devices and iPad devices. Uh, but what we've done is we've taken several of the really powerful apps and we've sort of added a whole bunch of more features and we've added them into or, or made them into plugins for Photoshop, Lightroom, and Aperture. They also work as standalone. Now we're going to get into some sort of a conversational piece about a whole bunch of images, but I want to give you a quick introduction to the software so you know sort of the general direction that we're going to be going in as we get into sort of the creative speak that we're going to. I've uh, opened our first image into Photoshop. And we're going to use uh, a tool called Snap Heal Pro. And this, this is a you know, pretty standard sort of situation that might happen to you where you, you're out in a great landscape and we've got power lines. Or maybe we're, we're shooting you know, a town hall or something like that and there's this beautiful architecture but there's, there's uh, no parking signs out there. Uh, well, you've got to get rid of those. You have to Photoshop them, if you will. And uh, there's, a, there's a tool within Photoshop that's called Content Aware Fill you're not familiar with it, what it does is it allows you to remove stuff from images and the Photoshop will automatically fill in the pixels. Uh, the problem with that is that it's sort of a one try, one trick pony. Uh, if it's not perfect, you have to do a whole bunch of manual cloning. And what, that, what happens then is uh, you spend tons of time having to fix stuff. What Snap Heal Pro does, uh, as I move up into my filter drop down menu, go to my Mac Fun and click on Snap Heal Pro is this is going to give you nine different opportunities to get this shot right. Uh, and really all I've got to do to get rid of these power lines here is uh, click and make a brush or use my brush basically uh, to tell the software what I want to get rid of. So I want to get rid of the power lines, I want to get rid of uh, the power pole, so I've just gone and uh, clicked on the left, hold, held the shift button down, clicked on the other end, that's going to give me a nice straight line, and I click erase. What's going to happen is the software is going to go and get rid of those pixels that we don't want, and it's going to retain the pixels that we do want. Uh, so right now, we're actually using uh, the erasing mode global, but the nine different opportunities you have are housed within global, local, dynamic, precision settings as well, normal, high, and highest. Now, if the tool doesn't do a perfect job, and I actually meant for it to, to mess up the first time, and it, it did a really good job uh, uh, getting rid of the power line, uh, what you would do is actually switch into different erasing mode. Now, uh, we've gotten rid of this stuff. This looks pretty good, but I haven't distracted you enough uh, to, to <laughs> uh, not notice the pole that's over here, so I've got to do the exact same thing. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and click and hold Shift 
and I click my erase button. Let's go back to global erasing mode. And this is Snapheel Pro. It's as easy as that. Now, I, I want to show one more image, though, because I want to show it to you when it breaks. Because as you can see here, it's done a really good job uh, to get rid of that power line and the pole itself. Uh, is a quick before and after. That's the original. There's the enhanced. Now, this isn't the most creative or fun tool in the world, but it's a really fantastic utility that speeds you up and makes your life way easier so you don't have to do any of that manual kind of processing. Um, let's get rid of this image. Let's do the same thing. Uh, how about this photograph? Uh, where I've, I've already gone ahead and duplicated my background layer. I'm going to make this one really quick here. Dan, your, 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 image is lagging, your image is lagging a little bit behind the, um, the verbal side of things. All right, I'll slow down. <laughs> I've, we've been demoing for the uh, the Texas show here, and I've gotten into in-person presentation mode instead of webinar presentation mode. So uh, I've opened up into Snapheel Pro, and we've got a couple extraneous objects in the image that maybe we, we don't want in the photograph, uh, like this boat, for example. Right now in Photoshop or Lightroom, that's a relatively easy fix. You'd brush over that, you'd uh, click your erase, or you'd use your content-aware fill, and that's going to give me a nice, clean fix. But then there's this other boat down here in the foreground. And most photographers would either just crop this out or not have shot this particular composition in the first place so you don't have that problem. So this is not necessarily a real world situation, but this is something uh, that if you needed to get rid of it, you know, if for some reason we shot an image in a certain way and, and we didn't want a particular object in the shot, uh, what we would do is go into Snapheel Pro, mask it out, and I'm actually going to try local here. I want to see if we can break it. Uh, click Erase. Uh, and then we've got this cool fact as well that pops up. So watermelons are 97% uh, water and so on. So you don't have to wait um, with a little bouncing ball. There isn't a little uh, hourglass as the software processes. It actually gives you a little bit of trivial knowledge as well. It's kind of fun. All right. So we've broken the software. This is what you'd normally see um, with a content-aware fill or, or a standard tool typically if we're trying to get rid of you know, an eighth of the photograph. Um, but the, the difference between Snapheel Pro and a, a typical sort of content uh, unaware sort of fix is that I have those nine different opportunities to get rid of this stuff. So I'm just going to click on local. I'm going to let that sort of hash it out. Let's see what happens. And there we go. So now, as I click my uh, checkbox in the upper left-hand corner of the interface, brings us back over into Photoshop because we were using this as a plugin. You know, now we've fixed that composition and gotten rid of again basically an eighth of the photograph uh, to replace it for the uh, for the nice beach. Let, let me uh, interrupt for a moment, Dan, and say uh, the content-aware fill function has not been in Photoshop all that long by you know the length of time that Photoshop has been around, and most Photoshop users had their own techniques and their own ways of using cloning and other tools to to deal with these issues and when Content Aware Phil came out we all tried it and we said oh this is smart in stupid situations and it's stupid in smart situations and then we went back to doing things the way we'd done them before and it's mm -hmm. only when you see the simplest of situations that you would really think of using the Content Aware Phil to try to fill something because otherwise you get, um, like I said, stupid results. So this, what's clever about this is not just that it gives you more controls than that, it's that it, you know, some, some good tools are on the borderline with magic and when used well, this does the impossible. I mean, the shot you have in front of you has got such complex background that if I looked at that and said, mm -hmm. okay, this is, this is my best photo of the day, Am I going to be able to, you know, edit what I need to in this image, and how many hours is it going to take me? The answer is yes. As I always used to say about Janice Wentz, you know, miracle examples of how she can edit an image. Everything she just did, I can do in Photoshop. Just give me a week. And that's mm -hmm. the situation here. <laughs> so I want to see you do this and not take a week, Dan. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that's a really great point as well. You know, there, we're designed to... Uh, to, to give you something smarter, easier, and faster. That's why these plugins can even exist, right? Because otherwise, if we're doing the exact same thing as what Photoshop is doing, there's no point in it, um, it unless it is that much, that much faster. So, you know, not only are they, uh, do we provide sort of more simpler processes that are faster, but like you said, they're going to be smarter as well. 
Now, I want to give you a quick intro to uh, another tool. It's called Focus 2 Pro. And then uh, I'll open up some of David's landscape images and we can start our conversation about that stuff too. Uh, the, the tool that we just took a look at was Snapheel Pro. We're going to take a look at Focus 2 Pro, uh, which is a, a tool for adding creative focus to an image. And apparently I have a new version available. So uh, you, you will get little updates like this. So the software just, you know, obviously I'm connected to the internet. It pinged the system, says, okay, there's a new version. So I can just click install update uh, and it's going to install that for me. We'll do that later though. Now, uh, we've got our Focus 2 Pro open. And as you open up the software, it's a very simple interface. And what you've got down in the bottom of the interface are a series of presets for different kinds of photography that you might be working on. So if we had a portrait, I'd click on portrait. If we were working, or we wanted to work on a, a tilt shift sort of uh, a look and feel, you've got a tilt shift option. Uh, what we want to do is click on architecture. In this case, we've We've got an architectural sort of image. And what this is going to give us is this, this really nice sort of creative blur, blurring effect. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like having Lytro after you shoot, right? <laughs> uh, what we're able to do here is, is click in, in our preset. It's going to actually give us a certain given set of adjustments based upon that preset. So architecture is going to do this. It's vertical, has that nice um, tilt shifter. Uh, in terms of the middle, it's going to be tack sharp. Then you've got a transition from the edge of the first line out until the second line, and then anything out there is going to give you that blurred image outside of uh, outside of that line. And then you can just yeah, click drag and just rotate with it. There was just one thing I wanted to mention was that this is one of the features that I like about it is that it gives you a starting point. Um, it's completely flexible, as Dan will show you in a minute, but it gives you a starting point with the architecture, which you really don't get in Photoshop or Lightroom. You're pretty much on your own with whatever edits you're going to make. And this gives you at least an example with some presets, as you can see over on the right-hand side, that are already in place as a nice starting point for your work. Absolutely. Really well said as well. Um, and and th th that's the thing about being creative. Oftentimes, if we have this tool that, that gives you all of these different kinds of capabilities, but you don't have an example of what it maybe could do for you, uh, you know, it, it feels limiting. So in, in all of these tools, you know, your, your Focus 2 Pro and the Intensify Pro software that we're going to be looking at in a little bit, we've got great presets as starting points, and they're, they're great for seeing the potential of a photograph, and then they're also great for speeding up your workflow. So they've kind of got those, those two uses. Uh, now, I don't even need to really do much to this photograph because with the architectural preset, it's, it's pretty much set. But if we wanted to, we can control the amount of blur. We've got vignette control so we can darken that stuff. Uh, and, and by the way, you'll notice on the right-hand side of the interface, it's broken into the blur area. So you're controlling what's blurred. You have a motion section. So I can actually create a motion blur as well if that was the goal of the image. If we were panning or something, uh, we could create a nice motion blur. And then you can control the stuff that's in focus as well. So if we needed a little more clarity, a little more sharpening. Uh, we can control that stuff that's in focus uh, while not affecting the, the out of focus stuff at the same time. So it's a nice additional uh, sort of capability. Uh, and that in a nutshell is Focus 2 Pro. And I don't want to spend too much time on this tool specifically on this image uh, because we've got a whole series of photographs uh, to, to, to sort of rock it through. So I just wanted to give you a quick intro as to uh, sort of the goals of the software as we, as we take a look at those. So let's quit Photoshop. And I'm going to open up our, our first official image, if you will, uh, and we're going to open into Intensify Pro, which is uh, a tool that is designed for controlling texture, sharpness, and contrast. And the, the reason why this exists is because there are four or five proprietary algorithms built into the software that are very different from any other uh, kind of contrast or texture control. And again, then we house these things in these wonderful presets. So for potential sort of activity, um, you know, you, you're able to look through and, and click on these different, different ones, like creative, for example. Now, a little bit of background about this image. Um, this is taken in an area of, of Washington state called the Palouse, which is a farming area. Uh, it's the result of um, what, they're rolling hills, which are the result of the mass flooding a, a couple of million years ago uh, that deposited all kinds of um, glacial debris and topsoil and such uh, uh, hundreds of square miles. And they grow wheat and barley and 
canola and all kinds of things. And it's it's really amazing. This is this these are different kinds of weed growing in, in different fields. Uh, and for scale, you can see in the background there, there's a giant tractor um, in the far distance. Um, and I like, uh, when I took this photograph, I like the textures and such and the in intersecting lines and so on. But it does have some issues because there's water haze in the air. So near the top of the photo, for example, the sky goes a little bit blown out and the haze is, is kind of desaturating and defocusing some of the, um, the areas towards the top of the image. So, those are those are issues that you might address here, uh, and of course there's some other opportunities that Dan will get into. Uh, I'm wondering well, if David Toby has any comments. Yeah, there's there's this thing that's happened where you know we shoot all day, be it you know in the Palouse or Tuscany, and get this kind of image, and at the end of the day, you know we take something we shot on our iPhone and we process it, and uh, we send that one off to Facebook, and then when we get looking at our real images we say, gee, there's nothing here as poetic as what I just did, you know, with the phone photo. And so, as well as wanting to do kind of serious landscape architect things to an image where, you know, you're eliminating the haze in the distance and, and creating more uh, differential between the hills and between the different colors of grain and, and bringing out the texture, there's also that question of, are there things that we expect of a photo today, you know, kind of poetic things that um, that we can do to enhance this image kind of beyond the standard landscape image? And that, that gets into kind of some philosophical areas of what it is you're comfortable doing to your images and what you think is a photo and what you think is a, um, you know, an altered photo. So, you know, as we look through these controls, they give us the capability of doing all sorts of stuff. And the first thing you have to really decide is what is it you want to do? I agree with Dave, we could reduce the hazing in the distance, though it gives us some atmospheric perspective. We could certainly enhance the difference between these crops and sharpen the detail in them. Uh, we could go for um, more differential between the layers so that the depth stands out more. And uh, all of that is, is related to a set of controls that can also be used for, you know, kind of over-the-top processing, which makes this into uh, potentially, you know, the Wizard of Oz rather than the Palouse. So it's it's always your call how how far to push these controls and what image you want to end up with. And and what you'll find within Intensify is that you have all of those kinds of capabilities. So you've got things like you know, the more creative stuff. If I go into the creative presets and I click on you know dramatic number three, this is going to give me a really sort of dramatic bleach bypass effect. Now. Let's say you love that, but maybe it's a little bit too much. We want to get creative with it. You know, we like the dramatic feel, uh, but but it's a little too much. What I can actually do is move into that preset and just dial it down a bit. So I can click into my amount slider and bring that to maybe 70% or 80%. So you still get that creative feel, um, but without necessarily taking it too far over the top, unless that's the goal, which is, you know, a, a definite possibility. And of course, taking the over the top is is a completely you know like as David Toby was talking about as philosophical thing. It's a it's it's however you feel uh, creatively um, you want to take that image in that direction. In this case, uh, I want to definitely introduce to you some of those creative presets, but I also want to make sure uh, that we've we've corrected any issues that we might see. And uh, that's one of the things that's really powerful about this tool is that you do have the ability to make that intense, intense image, uh, or I can just go into something like this Pro Quality preset, which actually, as we clicked on it, it doesn't look like it's really done anything. But if we look at the before and after, it's, it's very subtle. Here's the before, and there's the after. It's just giving you that, that nice little bit of crisp feel to the photo. So, so you've got that whole you know, that, gamut. Could you, you do that again? Can you do that again, because it didn't Absolutely. really come through. And I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit so it's easier to see. Um, that's the original. And, and again, this one's very subtle. And there's the enhanced. Right? So it's just that little, little extra bit. Is that, is that coming through? Yeah, one more time. Yeah, it comes okay, through eventually, so people have to keep their eye right on it as you change, because it may change later on their screen. I see. Yeah, a little bit of latency in that connection. So we're, we're looking at the before right now. I'm going to let go. Just keep your eyes open. Don't blink. <laughs> Uh, and then after should show up. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. That showed up. Yep. It's like I just put my reading glasses on. 
Yep. Yeah, it just <laughs> kind of just pops it in place there for you. Uh, now, we're going to use Natural Enhance, which is, uh, I believe, under my Detail Enhancement section. And a lot of these presets are going to be, um, you know, very subtle uh, or, or rather crisp as well. Then there's these, these really, really over-the-top, here's Mega Details, which on this image, maybe it's not necessary because what that ends up doing is flattening the whole space. Right? It's wonderful to be able to add these additional kinds of textures, but if we do it to the whole image, uh, oftentimes it, it uh, sort of detracts from the, the depth and these leading lines that we've got going throughout the photograph. All right. Actually, let's go with crisp. So that crisp one is just going to, to give us this little bit of sharpening, a little bit of extra pop, and I'm going to pull down the amount. Now, the next step that we've got here because you're saying, okay, yeah, I got it, you got presets. But the next step that you've got here that's really important about these presets is that I can add layers. So if I move into the upper right-hand corner and I click my plus button, now we've got our corrected image, you know, that crisp preset, but now we can move into uh, maybe something under creative and click on dreamy. So now what we're doing is we're stacking these presets together, right? So this dreamy one is going to give us this, this very subtle vignette. It amplifies the color a little bit, and we've still got our sort of base texture as well. You know, and this Dan, is just at a this very point, with, with two clicks, you've already gotten me to this place where I say, darn, I don't know how I actually would have done that in Photoshop. You know, that's um, I, three or four layers in, that's inevitable. But at this point, you know, you've sharpened it in one hand, you've made a dream in the other. And, and I would tend to think of those as a slider moving in opposite directions and the answer is no these are very different sliders and they're and they're succeeding in and uh, accenting each other in a very nice way and I, I think it's a pretty exciting change I like it a lot yeah and it was like we said two clicks right yeah. <laughs> now what we've done here adding these presets uh, can be saved a few different ways um, I want to I don't want to do too much to this photograph because I think the capture was already really quite nice and there aren't too many things that we even need to do. Although we could maybe burn the bottom edge, you know, to sort of lead the viewer's attention into the middle. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'll, I'll go ahead and open up the next photograph, unless you guys have other things you might want to talk about in the photo. Now, David tends to shoot a pretty good raw capture. Uh, improving on it is not always easy. Yeah. Yep, that's what I'm finding. <laughs> And, and that's why I wanted to show Snap Heal Pro beforehand, because what I noticed about the images that David had was there, there were no extraneous things. Um, you know, there's, he had composed them in such a way where there was nothing to get rid of, which, uh, you know, that's, that's ideal, um, but there are lots of situations where uh, we, we can't capture with, you know, without having that trash can at the beach in the shot or something, sure. or, or a cone in the background. Over the years, we've always joked about the uh, the Tuscany under, underground power line fund because we're so tired of removing power lines from our Tuscan scenery. And uh, the answer is, <laughs> in, instead of paying millions of dollars to bury all the power lines in Tuscany, it's, it's much simpler to have a good tool for removing them. Yep, yep. <laughs> and, you know, twenty nine ninety nine gets you that snap heel, <laughs> which uh, I don't, you know, the... Uh, it's kind of just an incredible thing that, that you've got such a utility uh, and it's, it's a really inexpensive price as well. But that's not why we're here. I just wanted to throw that out there too. <laughs> now, I'm going to save this image and there are a few different ways to save the photograph uh, or export the image. I can export directly into Photoshop because right now what we're doing is using the software as a, as a standalone. Sorry, we didn't use it as a plugin this time. Or back into Lightroom so we could actually send it into Lightroom or Aperture or Elements, uh, or into Snap Heal Pro. Uh, and I also have another tool that we've developed, which is a series of sort of filters, uh, FX Photo Studio. But uh, that's going from Intensify into the tool, into those extra um, sort of editing systems. Uh, but if we were done with the image, I'd likely go to the export and then save it as a, a TIFF or a JPEG. So you can do all of that right inside the interface. I'm going to go yeah. ahead and quit. Important to point out here, Dan, too, that you know uh, there are kind of those things we do in RAW these days, and the number of those is increasing, and those things which require us to, to export to Photoshop or to use some kind of plugin. And it doesn't really matter uh, whether you're using a Lightroom plugin or a Photoshop plugin or a standalone plugin, or if you're working in Photoshop itself, the answer is as soon as you step out of Lightroom, then you're out of your RAW file 
and you're even if you're conveniently putting it back into your Lightroom library and it's still high bit and all that, you know, you're you're in a second generation file now. And there's nothing to be scared about about that except that it's no longer the original raw file. You're now saving a second copy. And so you do that uh, to those files you care enough about to do this processing on and and end up with uh, you know a second copy of them. Now this, this photo, that's, a, that's a great point to make. This photo was taken in Zion National Park about a week and a half ago. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the park, there's a tunnel that goes over to Bryce National Park. And just outside the east entrance to the tunnel, there's a walk which goes pretty much straight up for about a quarter mile and then across the rocks to this overlook. So if any of you are ever in the park, this is a relatively easy hike. Um, takes about a half an hour, 40 minutes to get there, and the view is well worth the walk. Um, just so you know, I shot this with a 14 millimeter um, lens on a 35 full frame format digital camera. Mm, I know that 14 millimeter lens. It's a cinema lens that he does beautiful time lapse and video work with as well. Uh, now, like every every canyon shot, this image has the issue of bright sun and dark shadows, and uh, you may have already processed for that, David. But you know, this is this is the thing we joke about in Tuscany as well, where the buildings are always you know five stories high and ten feet apart. Uh, there's no way to shoot the street scenes there without having the same effect. So as the dynamic range of cameras get better, the capability to work with that gets better. And we can make the images look in the image the way they look to our eye. Because you know what, when you're standing there, this looks fine. When you shoot it, it looks horrible. And so dealing with those shadows is one of the issues. And one of the things I love about these um, fun products is that they have controls that allow you to make adjustments specifically to the shadow zone, the mid-tone zone, the highlight zone, uh, that have levels of control in, in them that other tools do not. So hopefully Dan will uh, will experiment with this for us here. Absolutely, and that's that's kind of what I was uh, thinking that we'd probably do to this image. So this is a perfect you know lead up to to the tools that we're going to be taking a look at. Um, you know, as he mentioned, when you're shooting a scene like this, you know, you want to generally expose for the highlights so that we have highlight information, uh, you know, in the clouds here. But what then happens is that your shadows go almost black, if not totally black. Uh, within Intensify Pro, uh, you, you do have those presets, right, as we just take, took a look at, but you also have a full series of tools. Uh, and your presets, as you click on those, they're going to adjust all of the adjustment sliders in this tool set but you can go in and manually adjust these things as well and that's going to give you you know far more control on, on, on your photograph now what's great is that these are proprietary contrast and density adjustments so the results that you get out of uh, Intensify Pro will actually be different and generally better than what you're going to be seeing uh, in, in almost any sort of uh, tool that, that is going to give you the same or similar capability. Uh, for example, in the basic tune section, you do have a shadow slider, right? And and that as you slide it to the right, it's going to brighten the shadow. If you slide it left, it's going to darken the shadow. So you do have the ability to you know add more contrast if we wanted those shadows to go darker. Uh, but I want to open them up. So I'm going to go ahead and slide that over to maybe 60 or 70 percent. And this is going to give us a nice result just to begin with. Uh, but but we're not done yet. That's not the only shadow control that we've got. In fact, the really powerful one in one of our proprietary tools uh, is called Pro Contrast, which breaks the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows down, as uh, Mr. Toby had mentioned. Uh, and even better than that, you get more control over those shadows, those midtones, and those highlights because you have a contrast slider. Right, which is going to, in this case, open up those shadows, and it's going to add contrast to those shadows. But then you have what's called an offset slider, which is a, a, a complicated sounding name. It right? doesn't necessarily mean too much to most folks, but what it does is it allows us to control uh, those, those shadows even further. So in this case, and I'll take it too far, but if I slide this offset slider way to the left, now we can open up all of that shadow information. Again, same as if we were to add texture to the entire image, this is going to flatten the whole photograph. So I don't necessarily want to take it this far, 
unless that's the goal, right? It might be interesting to to sort of tone map the whole thing so that it's very flat and then add a whole bunch of texture, right? That's something that could be done. Uh, but what we want to do is maybe uh, dial that back just a touch, and I'm just going to kind of correct the shadows a bit. And then the beauty of this is that it shouldn't enhance uh, any of the noise that is within those shadows, even though we're really brightening them up. Um, you know, it, it can, in certain situations, bring out a little bit of noise, but it, it's at designed so that it shouldn't. So you should be able to get these great results. Now, I'm going to go yeah, back up one, into uh, my highlights. One of, one of the issues about shooting landscapes, particularly space, I mean, when, when you stand there in front of a canyon or a situation like this, there's this incredible sense of three-dimensionality and space, and it's, and it's quite awe-inspiring. And then you shoot it, and you bring it back, and it's a flat image. And so part of the goal always with processing these images is to, um, to make them read the way they looked when you saw them. That's the issue with the shadows. But also to make the sense of three-dimensionality um, more powerful. And so sometimes we're in conflict. I mean, there's haze in the distance. You could, you could unhaze that. On the other hand, that haze is a form of dimensionality. There are various things here. The level of detail into the distance, if you simply uh, increase the, the detail in this entire image, that would add detail in the distance, which would again decrease the sense of dimensionality. Now, you could probably get away with doing both those things on this image because it is such a powerful shot that the three-dimensionality shows up no matter what you do to it. So, um, so I'm going to be interested to see what you do choose to do to this to, to improve this shot. I want to mention in, in something as long as we're, we're in a, a, a bit of a gap here. One of the questions asked is asking, why does it show a 50 millimeter lens when I said it's a 14? And the reason is, is that the lens I'm using is, is not a Canon lens. It's made by Rokinon and it does not communicate with the camera at all. It's strictly manual. So the camera stamps the image with its default, which is 50 millimeters. So that's the answer to that question. Interesting. Yes, I, I, I didn't even anybody notice with that a photo there. background would know this is not a 50 millimeter image, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just you know just asking a question about is there something wrong with the software, or, and their answer yeah. is no. The software is working fine. It's reflecting what's what's in the EXIF data for the photo. Absolutely, yeah. So it's just stripping out that that data from the original file and saying, okay, it assumes it's the 50 millimeter because that's the default. That's the default, right? Now, um, Mr. Toby brings up a great point, uh, and we do have that little bit of atmospheric haze back there in the background, and we could do two things: we could either get rid of it, or uh, we could we could actually enhance that even further. We could add more blue and cool that down and maybe even remove a little bit of detail, which could sort of direct the viewer's attention that way and, and create this, this little bit of uh, dimensionality. And to do something like that, you just uh, add a new layer and maybe change the color temperature of the image just a touch. So I'll go and take my temperature slider uh, down to negative 26, which is going to make it a little bit more blue. And then I'm going to go into the details section and I want to actually remove a little bit of detail. Because as you get further back, if you do have that sort of atmospheric haze, I want to brighten this up just to touch as well. It seems as though that uh, darkened it down a little bit. Uh, as you get that atmospheric haze back there, not only are you going to have a more cool tone, typically, unless you're in LA and then it might go brown. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, the you're gonna you're gonna lose uh, not not resolution necessarily, but you're, the perception of detail because of the the water droplets that's you know creating that atmosphere haze. Uh, so what we want to do after we maybe remove and, and cool that down is only apply it to this section back here to the the furthest distance. And it might even be interesting to not apply it um, you know right into these highlight areas, which is a creative choice. Even though you know optically that might not necessarily happen because you still have that sort of distance. Uh, but anyways, what I'm going to do here is just brush my effect in. And what I did to do that is I clicked on the brush button that you'll find in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, or sorry, upper right-hand corner, my apologies. Uh, and, and this is going to give us the ability to actually create layer masks right in the software. So I can paint the effect in with a brush or erase the effect out um, using the eraser tool. So we'll get rid of it right out of there. And then maybe we could even take it a little bit further because it's a very subtle kind of so we can make it even more blue. Oops, that's way too far. 
and then maybe even not brighten it up, but add just a smidge of contrast. And I think before I add any more layers, let's just take a look at the before and after. You know, it's always a good idea to, to kind of assess the image before you actually start doing anything. And when you get to a stopping point like this, where you said, okay, I've opened up the shadows a bit, we've emphasized that atmosphere case, what is it, are we done, or could we go further, or do we need to go further? Uh, in this case, again, because the image is, is gorgeous and it has this sort of epic feel and these great clouds, we might not necessarily need to do too much creatively to it, uh, but, but one little trick that generally works well uh, for directing a viewer's attention is to utilize vignettes. And one of the features in here is, of course, a vignette tool, but then you can also brighten up the, of the image. And what that's going to allow us to do, oops, as I need to add a new layer. So let's go back down into that section to the vignette area, uh, and I darken down my edge a little bit, I can actually brighten up the, the center point, right? So this is going to create this kind of tunnel vision that we've already got on the photograph. And I think I've darkened at the edge a little bit too much, but have that sort of sense of, of direction and depth in the photo by darkening down that edge and leading the viewer's attention towards the center of the image. So there's the before, and there's the after. And like I said, I think I might have added a little bit too much of a vignette Maybe we'll take it back just a touch. But now we've got that great sense of depth. And it ties in nicely with the wide-angle lens. Uh, the joke being David got this excellent 14-millimeter lens that doesn't darken in the corners, and you've just unfixed that for him. But yes, the effect <laughs> is excellent. <laughs> yeah, we sp spend thousands of dollars on these lenses so that we don't, you know, it's edge-to-edge -edge sharpness, and we've got no drop-off around the corners. And then in the post-processing, we go and add a vignette, right? <laughs> But for creative purposes, it's always nice to have that straight image where you don't have anything dark on the edge, but you, you capture it properly, and then you have the, the license afterwards and the control afterwards to, to get the exact amount of drop-off around this, the edge that you might want. This is exactly what we say about color management. Even if you're going to put color effects uh, into your images, color managing them so they're all consistent and correct first gives you a baseline onto which to do that. So it's a similar concept. Absolutely, and, and we haven't really tied too much stuff about the color management into this, but, but what I can almost guarantee is that what David Toby is seeing and that what David Saffer is seeing and what I'm seeing on my screen are going to be almost the same other than whatever you know, the, the webinar system would change uh, throughout on these images because we're all utilizing the, you know, a calibrated uh, system. Now, I want to save this photograph, and, and as we mentioned before, uh, we are using the tool as a standalone. If we use it as a plugin, there'd be an extra button where we'd click apply and it would bring us back over into Photoshop or back over into Lightroom. Uh, and we'd either have a second image in our Lightroom stack or our Lightroom catalog, um, or in Photoshop you'd be able to uh, work on a separate, right, so that uh, you're, you're working in non-destructive processes in that way. Uh, now, I want to actually export, or sorry, save this image as a proprietary uh, intensify project because if I go to export and I save it as a TIFF file, I would no longer have these layers here, right? So what I can do is go up to my file drop-down menu, click Save As, and now I can save this, you know, as uh, uh, David Seffer uh, Zion. You'd have a much better naming convention than this, but uh, we click Save, and then if I go to my landscape folder, uh, we'll have that uh, set up. And I'll show you what that file looks like with Intensify Pro. Uh, it's actually going to look like this. So uh, this file format, if you notice, has a little sort of, a, what's this called, pigtail? Or pig, is it the, the corner's been folded over. And this is a proprietary yeah. Intensify Pro project. So if I just double click on this one, it will open me directly into Intensify Pro. And what you'll notice is that um, our adjustment layers in the upper right-hand corner are all sort of built out already because it's, it's going to work in a non-destructive process that way it's because now I've got the ability to go and turn all of these things off and we can start over from scratch from the original file uh, that we opened up. Now, I think this will probably be, well, we've probably got time for an extra image after this, but I wanted to make sure to get into this one. Uh, but do we want to do a little bit of an assessment on this photograph before I sort of run through 
uh, the before and after, right? Because there's one thing to just show you what I did. It's another thing to sort of discuss it and uh, figure out what we might want to do that's separate or different than what I did in the first place. Uh, there's the original. Uh, this is also shot in the Palouse. We call this one the Bay's Hotel. Um, it's in the middle of a field of wheat, and so it's not surrounded by grass. That's wheat that's about um, almost chest high, uh, very, very thick stalks of wheat. So I actually got up on a ladder to shoot this so I could get over the tops of the plants. Um, and I also think it's very interesting. This building is probably close to 100 years old. It's had electrical service added to it at some point. You can see it's had a couple of rooms added to it. Uh, got very lucky with the sky that day. Um, and there were no farmers wandering around, so this, the shot turned out okay. Um, late in the day, very direct light, very, very bright. Uh, so there's some issues in the foreground, and particularly in the front of the house. Uh, it's probably a little bit too hot for, uh, for a final, but it's, it's a good starting point for Dan to take it away and, uh, and move forward with it. Uh, David, Toby, any comments? Yeah, this is an excellent capture, and as you state, and this is often the case, you, you find a wonderful landscape shot, and when you, all is said and done, you could have shot it an hour sooner or an hour later, and, and it would have been a mediocre landscape shot. It's not that the landscape has changed, it's the cloud patterns and locations mean so much. And if you look at these cloud mm -hmm. patterns here, the way that they, the main drift of clouds comes up from the house and then a smaller one comes up from the little outbuilding. I mean, that's just uh, a wonderful cloud pattern and it, and it just adds so much to this image. Uh, we always make the joke about it. If it hadn't looked like that in the original photo, we'd be obliged to do that to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, and then that's the other thing about the, uh, um, you know, working with a, not an image like this, but w here I'm going to go and turn this black and white so that I can show you that Intensify Pro can, can do that. But here we've got these, these great sort of complementary colors in the photograph as well, which is you know, really important when working with landscape. Um, with this directional light, there isn't a whole lot of difference between, you know, the, these densities in the foreground. You know, there's a little bit of difference in the color back here, but, but having these greens be, you know, this, this wonderful yellow and having just that nice strip in the foreground, and he's got you know this, he's working with the rule of thirds on this one, and you've got this this you know well placed house and building as well, and then the blues this comes together really nicely, um, you know, and when you're out in that landscape, you, you definitely want to be paying attention to those colors. Yeah, and it this is a, what we you know, call this is what spot. we call it two color <laughs> image, and you know many of my best photographs are two color images, and. When you look at an image like this, it's really hard to know whether the color version of this or the black and white version is going to be preferable, and you're really stuck simply editing it both ways, at least preliminarily, and seeing what happens. If the first time you turn it black and white, it turns dead flat and falls apart, you may decide that you're not even going to pursue it further. But given the right tools, even under that circumstance, uh, you may very well be able to come up with a great black and white image. So I'm curious to see what we can do here. All right, let's take a look. Oh, we got a little feedback or something going on. Sorry, sorry. Oh, no problem. All right. Uh, so first off, let me just show you what I had done originally to the image. And well, I will contrast. And then we'll sort of build it up because we did open our proprietary, you know, that file format. Um, so, and I think we could probably do this a little bit differently than what I even did after looking at the, this in the first place. Uh, but I'm, I'm using this top layer here. I clicked on it in the upper right hand corner as just a little bit of sharpening and I've, I've done this visually uh, and I've only applied the sharpening in the building and and we don't necessarily have to do this but the reason I did do that is to just draw your attention a little bit more uh, towards the building because if you have something that has a little extra contrast or it's a little sharper than the rest of the photograph uh, your eye is going to be drawn into that section a bit more so that's why I decided to do that sort of last on that that bit now, layer two is a burned edge, right? So this is going to help to sort of push the viewer's attention in towards the middle. It's kind of like the vignette did, but uh, this is applied in a slightly different way um, and only sort of brushed into the foreground. And then we've got a, a great gradient tool that we're going to use as a sort of graduated neutral density to darken down the top and sort of uh, keep the horizon nice and bright. 
And the, the way that we're going to do that is actually kind of important uh, because with a, a standard graduated neutral density, uh, you have, you know, it's just a straight line, right? So oftentimes I might want my graduated neutral density filter that I might be shooting out in the field. I would oftentimes want it to go all the way down to the horizon, but I can't do that because uh, this building is here and the top of the building is then going to be darker than the bottom of the building and that typically doesn't make any sense, right? That, to have the bottom be brighter than the top, unless there's a really unique lighting situation going on. So we're going to take a look at how to do that, how to utilize a graduated neutral density kind of effect within Intensify. And uh, the other thing that's happening in this image is it is again a really fantastic capture. So David's got all of the highlight information, he's got all of that shadow information. And David, as you mentioned, there is a, there's kind of a bright spot right in here. Uh, we could go in and, and kind of take care of that a little bit and see what would happen if we uh, actually don't even touch the highlight slider within the basic tune. I go into my pro contrast slider, and we might need to do this on a separate layer, but I'll go ahead and just bump that up and then slide my offset slider, uh, oops, actually to the left, or sorry, to the right. And let's see what happens in just that little area. It, it should kind of take those really bright tones, bring them down, uh, yet still retain a nice contrast range. And if we wanted to do that, I could just paint the effect just into that one particular section so that we're just getting that, uh, that added highlight information uh, right into that area. That's maybe a little bit too bright overall. It's a nice little trick as well. If, there, if we've got anybody who, you know, who shoots weddings or shoots portrait work uh, and you've got a hot spot on somebody's face, this tool by sliding that contrast slider to the right, offset slider to the right as well, will typically darken those tones down but yet retain um, a nice contrast range so that it doesn't look funky and flat, which is something that can happen if I, uh, you know, if I try to darken down a highlight. Alrighty. So we're going to do that but it's on a separate layer. Because what I had done uh, originally is I wanted to convert this to black and white. And to do that, I want to convert my layer 0 to uh, a full black and white layer. So let me even reset my mask. There we go. Clear and invert. Click saturation. Bring that down to uh, negative 100. That's going to pull the color out. And then what's interesting here is that even though we're pulling the color out, uh, utilizing that saturation slider, you can still utilize your, your color temperature uh, and this can give you some sorts of creative license uh, for, for maybe adding contrast and affecting the image, which if I were to, um, oops, sorry, if I were to bring the saturation back into the photograph, the whole image is going to look really funky. But as it's desaturated, uh, this can be a creative feel for a black and white image that's going to be different uh, than what you can get typically as well. So keep in mind that you do have those saturate or sorry, uh, color temperature controls even though you're desaturating the photograph. So in terms of workflow, we're going to do a, a kind of macro to micro workflow. That is, uh, I'm going to and I'm going to do this relatively quickly because I just realized we're coming up on our time. But uh, I want to do the big you know, the presets first, the things that's going to affect the entire image first, and then we kind of make our way down into the more specific stuff. Uh, so we do the bulk of the work first, and then, uh, you know, just make our way down, which is exactly what we're going to do here. Uh, I want to add a graduated neutral density to the image, so um, I'm going to add an extra layer. I'm going to take my exposure down, maybe add some contrast, and we might take this a bit further than this uh, in just a second. In fact, let's bring that down much further than what we'll even leave it at. Uh, and we're going to click on our graduated filter. So the graduated filter is going to give us uh, the ability to apply the effect by default up here in the top and not apply the effect that we just did down at the bottom. We don't have to use this as a sort of traditional graduated neutral density as what we're doing here. We can use this for you know, detail enhancements, for, for all sorts of directional purposes, um, and, and it works really well. Um, because you do have this, this effect, that is the graduated effect, uh, where, you know, again, it's darkening the top of the building, and I'm going to go ahead and take my exposure a bit further down. But then we can take it even further. When I click my Apply button, I can then go into my eraser, and we can work on this as a, as a, as a mask, right? So I can make sure that the top of the building isn't getting any of that graduated effect, and only the, uh, the, the top of the image, so we can open that back up. In fact, I say we push the contrast a bit further in the sky and then bring the exposure back just a touch. 
So now, again, we're sort of directing the viewer's attention towards the building. And I'm going to do this two more times. So, but not to, the, not to the top of the photograph. I'm going to actually do a graduated neutral density, but to the bottom of the photograph uh, to, to sort of push the viewer's attention towards the middle. Let's flip this around. And apply it just right in there. Let's even take that way further. There we go. And one more layer. Oops, as I have to click apply. That's one thing that I have to uh, point out. We're, when we're using the gradient tool, you have to finish off with the apply button. Because if I go in and I try to do uh, add an extra layer or anything like that, it's not going to let me until I actually click the apply button for the gradient. Um, just a, a sort of word to the wise, if you run into the fact that maybe you're, you can't add a new layer or something like that with Intensify, uh, you, you will want to make sure you click that apply button. All right. Let's break this up. That'll come contrast, and then let's brush this effect in, but at like a 50% opacity. And, and we haven't even been able to kind of touch upon more of these sort of structure controls here. There's all sorts of different sorts of proprietary contrast and texture controls. This is going to give us this really nice pop overall, uh, of the st structure that is, but I really just want it to be uh, the building. So we're going to go ahead and just click on that. And if I were using a Wacom tablet right now, I'm on a trackpad. I'm not doing a very good job masking this, uh, but I would want to sort of zoom in and make sure that I did a pretty good job uh, so I don't get any kind of uh, haloing effects, like if I jump over this and mess up on the edge of the image, sorry, on the edge of the, the, the thing that we're trying to mask in or out, um, I'm going to want to go back and get rid of that. And if I'm zoomed in and I'm, I'm being a little more careful, a little bit more precise, um, that's going to be much faster and easier. But anyways. There is our final black and white image. We take a quick look at the before and after. That's the original color photograph. We've added our three layers, four layers in total, and created a nice dynamic black and white image uh, that's directional and full of depth. Nicely done. Yes, bravo. <laughs> Software makes it pretty easy, so. Well, the, the problem is, when you shoot a thousand images a day, you always wonder how many of those you're actually going to process seriously. And there's always this backlog of images that are probably worth dealing with if it weren't for the localized editing. And so it's uh, the nice clean shots, you know by the end of the evening that those are good shots. It's the, it's the ones with the power lines and the, uh, the challenging secondary issues that you always wonder about whether you're really ever going to get an image out of them. And, and techniques that allow you to do that more quickly without compromise are uh, certainly a way to increase the number of uh, premium images you manage to capture. Okay, so Absolutely. it's um, it's getting to be about time to wrap this up. Do we want to do one more image quickly and then wrap it up? We we can most definitely. Um, I've, I can open up one last one, and we can actually go a little bit faster with it. Um, in that this image, we wanted to go very specific and brush those specs in and, and be very careful and, and utilize a lot of those functions. But you know, I want to make sure to drive home the point that. Uh, it can be very fast and yet very precise. You know, it, in that way, like David Toby said, uh, you can kind of you can get more images done. You can get these really fantastic uh, photos very quickly, um, and yet yet have a very refined look. You know, whether you're using Snapfill Pro to get rid of some things or Focus Two Pro uh, to to add a, a nice creative kind of blurring effect. In this case, we're just going to add two presets and then maybe very quickly brush. Uh, you know, a particular portion of each one of those effects out. So for our nice rusty truck here, which, David, this is a, an old Ford, right? Uh, it is, yes. It's out in the middle of a, somebody's farm. And is this from the Palouse area as well? It is, yeah. There's, there's oh. vehicles like this everywhere. It's amazing. Oh, that's awesome. So, so we're going to move into uh, detail enhancement. I'm going to click on detail extractor. Right, and when when this sort of pops in, again, what it's going to do is it's going to apply this texture throughout the whole photograph. Well, oftentimes that's that's not the best way to go, especially when we've got an image with a sort of relatively short depth of field. So what I want to make sure to do after I've clicked on that preset is erase the effect out of the background. 
right? So that I don't have the added texture in the background, unless that's the goal. Creatively, that could be very cool. Here, what I want to do is is sort of retain the feel of that depth of field that that, that, that we're getting from that, um, but still have a really nice kind of punch to the composition. And what I've done is erase the effect out completely back here, but what then we can do is control with our brush uh, the opacity and the softness and so on to maybe get rid of just a little bit of it uh, to, to sort of play with that depth of field. Or, or maybe hit the foreground here, um, maybe at 100%, and then not add the texture into these areas in the foreground or into a particular portion in the foreground if we didn't want to. Um, once we've done that with the preset, I'm just going to click again the, the plus button in the upper right hand corner and I'm going to add uh, another sort of creative preset and this is going to sort of darken down, add a little bit of a nice vignette. This is the autumn morning preset and this gives us this nice moody feel but um, we might not necessarily want all of it and we might not necessarily want all of it or most of it on most of the image. So I'm going to brush the effect into that background corner. And, and whenever we use the presets, we didn't really touch upon this too much. You, you do have the ability to go into the adjustments section as well. So, uh, you know, I've clicked on the preset, we brushed the effect in, but should we decide that maybe the exposure is going a little bit too dark, I can expand, uh, I can click my adjustment section, and then I can go into my exposure or my different contrast controls, and uh, we can kind of find this. So I can brighten that exposure back up a little bit. Maybe we'll go to 10% instead of the 30% or so. And then we've got the same densities throughout the image. Uh, now we've kind of played upon a, a checkerboard effect, though, by adding a little bit of vignette in the background. So it sort of goes dark to light to dark to light and so on. In fact, maybe it would be a good idea to kind of brush it into this corner down here uh, just to sort of uh, balance out that composition. But that's that. And it's, it's as quick and easy as that, or it's as... Um, it's as uh, well, complicated as you want to make it, but it is as specific as you want to make it as well, using those layer masks, using all of the proprietary contrast controls, and then even uh, mixing in Focus 2 Pro and Intensify Pro, or sorry, uh, Snap Heal Pro when needed as a utility, and other tools. You know, there's other tools out there that do a great job for these creative purposes, uh, and, and it works really well hand in hand with these Mac Fun tools too. So if you're using anything else, you know, you can throw this into the mix and you've got that extra tool set too. But that's it. That's about it for uh, for the demo. Okay. Let's um let's switch presenters. Uh, we do have some giveaways. Sure. Stay with us. So Absolutely. let's Here, see. Switch back over to you. Okay. So am I on? Yeah, I'll show my screen. There we go. Uh, first thing I wanted to mention was that we record these webinars, and this webinar will be available soon. You'll receive a link as an attendee, and you can view it again. We have a, a, quite a wide range of webinars. We've been uh, quite diligent, I think, in, in offering webinars that cover a range of photographic activities and topics, uh, including video, uh, conversions of still and motion capture, um, focus controls, soft proofing, screen to print match, um, architectural photography. There's about 30 of them, 35 of them now online. Uh, and also on the webinar page, you can check the schedule for upcoming webinars. We have several between now and the end of June scheduled. Uh, so please do check the schedule. You'll find some topics that will be interesting to at least a, a significant portion of you. Last, I want to thank DataColor and MacFun for um, uh, sponsoring this and making this possible. Uh, www.datacolor.com is the website or MacFun.com. Uh, there's a discount, 20% off all DataColor Spider products, excluding the Spider HD, which is a new product. Uh, purchased on the website, the discount code is EDIT20, and it's valid through May 7th. Uh, in the Mac Fun, it's 15% when shopping at www.macfun.com. The discount code is DC15. Again, that is valid through May the 7th. Uh, we have two winners. The Spider 4 Pro winner is Douglas Root, and the McFun Creative Kit Plus winner is Rita Rogers. Uh, Douglas and Rita, you'll be receiving an email from our marketing manager 
uh, informing you of your uh, status and asking you for contact information, validating that so we can get these products out to you. Um, again, I'm David Saffer. Uh, I have a blog at davidsaffer.wordpress.com and a website at davidsaffer.com. I think more importantly, if you have questions uh, about this or other topics related to photography or color management or printmaking, you can reach me at dsaffer at mac.com. I'll do this for my students. Uh, I do want to warn you, I travel a lot. Um, if you don't get an answer from me in 24 hours, please don't be afraid to bug me and send me another email saying, this is the second time. Um, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. David Toby's blog, which has also has some excellent content, is cdtoby.wordpress.com, and his website is cdtoby.com. I know that Dan is working on a website of his own, and that will be coming up soon, so watch for that. Thank you all for attending, and thank you for your attention, and we hope you join us next time. Have a great day.